Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the December's lecture. We're going to take a look at winter around the world. Um, it's going to be kind of it's a fun lecture. Uh, so when we talk about winter, though, we really have to kind of talk about all the seasons and go back to why the winter was so significant. Um, now, the four seasons can be likened to any cycle of four components, including uh, life, the phases of the moon, uh, positions of the sun. And this was really seen in every ancient culture because they, did, they don't have the knowledge that we had today. So spring, of course, there was a renewal of life. Uh, summer was regarded as the develop, developmental period. Um, uh, fall and fire was the third age of humankind's life cycle um, and its maturity um, and also rep would represent the harvest. And then winter, of, of course, was the, the fourth and final phase uh, of a person's life. And so winter symbolized hopelessness and de decrepitude. Um, and also winter was linked with the element of earth. Um, and of course, we're about to come up on the summer solstice or winter solstice, which is uh, the shortest day of the year and the longest day of the night um, and kind of signals this really powerful transition point um, uh, between the seasons that is really kind of impossible to ignore. And um, because of this, uh, the winter solstice was both celebrated and revered in ancient civilizations, in indigenous cultures, and in various religions, um, all of which really had their own rituals uh, to take advantage of this unique energy. So it was how do we harvest, get the energy from there and start spring to happen again. Um, it was one, some believed by some that on this day, the moon would give birth to the sun. And so kind of puts a magical spin on it as well, but it also made it make sense uh, for all these ancient cultures and what was happening and, and, and why things happened that way. So I just thought we'd take a quick look at some of the um, winter solstice uh, traditions around the world. Uh, and, 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 you know, just to see kind of the similarities and why they were doing it. Um, so we'll start in Scandinavia. Uh, this is uh, the Santa Lucia uh, day. Uh, this is the traditional festival of lights in Scandinavia. Um, Santa Lucia was one of the earliest Christian martyrs, um, but it was incorporated with earlier Norse solstice traditions after many Norsemen converted to Christianity. So again, we see also that combining of the pagan traditions with Christian traditions around the world. Um, according to the old Julian calendar, December 13th, um, is the, uh, the days when Romans killed Lucia for bringing food to persecuted Christians hiding in Rome. And this was also the shortest day of the year. Um, as a symbol of light, uh, Lucia and her feast day blended naturally with the solstice traditions, such as lighting fires to scare away spirits um, during the longest and darkest night of the year. On Santa Lucia's day, uh, girls in Scandinavia wear white dresses with red sashes and wreaths of candles on their heads as this homage to the candles that Lucia wore in her head uh, to light her way as she carried the forbidden food. Uh, now we head over to China here. Um, the Dongji Festival or Winter Solstice Festival, um, Dongji literally means the extreme of winter, is one of the most important Chinese and East Asian festivals celebrated by the Chinese, uh, Japanese, Koreans, and Vietnamese uh, during the Dongji solar term or winter solstice. Um, the oranges of the festival can be traced to the yin and yang philosophy of balance and harmony in the cosmos. After this celebration, there will be days with longer daylight uh, hours and therefore an increase in the positive energy flowing in. Uh, the most traditional food we see down in the bottom there, bottom right, are these rice balls uh, known as tang yuan, um, often brightly colored and cooked in sweet or savory broth. And uh, the Northern Chinese also often enjoyed plain or meat stuffed dumplings, um, uh, particularly warming for a midwinter celebration. Then we head to Iran. Um, on the longest night of the year, Iranians all over the world celebrate the triumph of Mithra, the sun god, over the darkness in the ancient festival of Shabi Yalda, which translates to night of birth. According to tradition, people gather together on this night uh, to protect each other from evil. Uh, they uh, light fires to uh, uh, burn fires to light their way uh, through the darkness and perform charitable acts. Uh, friends and family join in, in, the wish, in uh, making wishes, feasting on nuts, pomegranates, and other festive foods, and reading poetry, especially the work of the 14th century Persian poet um, Hafiz. 
Uh, some stay awake all night to rejoice in the moment when the sun rises, banishing evil and, and announcing the arrival of goodness. So what a cool thing that the, the solstice has done. Uh, here we are in Peru. Um, uh, the solstice is celebrated in June, of course, in the Southern Hemisphere. The Inti Raimi, which is Quechua for Sun Festival, um, takes place on the solstice, is dedicated to honoring Inti, the sun god. Before the Spanish conquest, the Incas fasted for three days before the solstice. Before dawn on the fourth day, they went to a ceremonial plaza and waited for the sunrise. When it appeared, they crouched down before it, offering cups of uh, chicha, which was a sacred beer. Um, uh, llamas were often uh, sacrificed. And uh, the Incas also used a mirror to focus the sun rays and to kindle a fire. So um, after the Spanish uh, made their conquest, they banned this holiday, but it was revived in the 20th century, albeit without the, the, the llama sacrifice. And then in Japan, uh, the winter solstice is less than a fe festival than a traditional practice, uh, centered around starting the new year with health and good luck. Um, it's a particularly sacred time of the year for farmers who uh, welcome the return of the sun that will nurture their crops after a long cold winter. Uh, people light bonfires to encourage the sun's return. Um, huge bonfires burn on Mount Fuji each December 22nd. Um, and so again, this whole tradition of, of, of celebrating the, the end of the winter and back to the, back to the summer again. The uh, Zuni Indians um, in Western New Mexico, the winter solstice signifies the beginning of the year and is uh, marked with a ceremon ceremonial dance called the Shalako. Um, after fasting, prayer, and observing the rising and setting of the sun for several days before the solstice, the Pequin or the sun priest traditionally announces the exact moment of Itiwana, the rebirth of the sun with a long mournful call. With that signal, uh, the rejoicing and dancing begin as 12 Kachina clowns in elaborate masks uh, dance along with the Shalako themselves. 12 foot high effigies with bird heads seen as messengers from the gods. Um, after four days of dancing, um, new dancers are chosen for the following year and the yearly cycle begins again. So you see this whole cycle uh, of, of life of the moon um, and, and of crops and of course of the seasons. Um, in uh, 5,000 years ago in ancient Egypt, uh, uh, the Egyptians celebrated the rebirth of the sun at this time of year. Uh, they set the length of the festival at 12 days to re uh, reflect the 12 divisions in their sun calendar. They decorated with greenery using palms with 12 shoots as a symbol of the completed year, uh, since a palm was thought to put forth a shoot each month. And so this kind of morphed into, um, uh, they, they moved it into their sun god, the sun god Ra. And then this also really moved around um, all of the area there. Um, it was copied by the Babylonians, the Persians and the Greeks um, who uh, renamed Hiru, uh, the, or Ra, the, the sun god, uh, with their own gods. And it is really where, um, the, where our Western traditions came from uh, with that. So the Romans really took this uh, from the Greeks and at, originally from the ancient Egyptians, and they had their, um, their celebration of Saturnalia. And so this is really what turns us into Christmas. Um, it started out as a one day celebration earlier in December, but the pagan festival later expanded into a riotous week long party stretching from December 17th to 24th. Uh, during this jolliest and most popular of Roman festivals, social norms fell away and there was gambling and drinking and, 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 and much gad about. But this is really, uh, again, where uh, the Christian traditions then would meld all these uh, with the pagan traditions so th that the pagans of, uh, would go along with Christianity. So just kind of fascinating to see uh, how similar we all are um, and, and what winter really signified and what the solstice really signified. So now we'll kind of start our journey in art. Um, now, early European paintings, painters um, generally uh, did not depict snow since most of their paintings were of religious subjects. The first artistic representation of snow came in the 15th and 16th centuries because uh, frequent snowfall is a part of winter in the Northern European company, uh, countries. The really first depictions started um, with the Northern European countries. 
um, since the early 15th century, wintry scenes had been represented by artists and uh, as parts of large sculpture works on churches and even on, on small scale in private homes. Uh, they were devotional scripts such as the Book of Hours, uh, devotional collections of, te of texts. Um, there were also the, the labors of the months, which was a cycle of 12 paintings um, that illustrated the social life, the agricultural tasks, uh, the weather and the landscape for each month of the year. So this is where it really began to come into Western art history um, as well. But again, it was all, all started out as that, how do we explain the cycles of the month with it? And so we see this as a uh, really nice one here by Paul Limborg that it shows the calendar up on the top there and then the different scenes going through the snow as well. Um, some snowy scenes actually appeared in a set of early 14th century uh, frescoes uh, created by Master Wenceslas for the Bishop's Palace at Trento, um, showing people throwing snowballs at each other. So that tradition has certainly lasted many, many years. Um, and this is, a, this is from a detail of um, Ambrogio Lorenzetti's effect of good government in the city and the countryside. Now, at that time, uh, landscapes had not really developed as a genre in art, which kind of really explains the scarcity of scenes in medieval painting. Um, and snow was really not depicted unless it had um, a context, which of course the calendar did. So that's what happened around the calendar there. Then, um, during the early Northern Renaissance, and even more during the Dutch Golden Age um, in the 17th century, interest in landscape painting was increasing. The winter of 1564 to 1565 was said to be the longest and most severe for more than 100 years. The beginning of a cold period in Northern Europe now called the Little Ice Age. Um, so for the next 150 years, Northern European winters were comparatively snowy and harsh. Uh, there was crop failures, heavy snowfalls, um, and it really kind of made it very grim for all the peasants. Um, but uh, it was in the early frigid winter of 1565 that uh, Bruegel created the Hunters in the Snow. And this was really regarded as the first true winter landscape painting. Um, again, though, it was part of a series that illustrated the months. Um, uh, uh, something th um, thematically similar to the traditional book of the hours. So still kind of following those things, but we just see this, this kind of this wonderful look at, at uh, it, you know, it makes everyone think they were going back into nice warm houses, but it was probably chilly inside and chilly outside. The, um, after a relatively warm period uh, that coincided with the end of the 17th century, the Dutch Golden Age, uh, the European climate turned cool again, um, uh, uh, moving through this. So the decade from 1810 to 1819 was the coldest in England since the 17th century. In 1812, the French Grande um, Armée was forced to retreat from Moscow uh, by the advancing winter, known to the Russians as the General Snow. And these climatic events played a great part in the development of this new um, art genre, which was the winter landscape. Um, these were often painted in plein air um, with the artist kind of again using that thin gray light of winter. And this is even before the impressionists got there. Um, uh, according to the, um, we see this beautiful painting here by Casper uh, David Friedrich, and according to the art historian um, Herman Benkin, Friedrich painted winter scenes in which no man has yet set foot in. Um, so it was based on his direct observation, but his landscapes were not perfectly reproduced what they did. So he kind of, uh, you know, took his, his own with it, with what the winter looked like, and I'm sure he didn't want to stay out in the snow and continue in uh, continue painting when it was so cold. But this was really part of romanticism and it was, they, they, it was just this uh, very intense emotion such as appre apprehension um, and terror and fear, but um, also just awe and awe in particular, especially when taking a look at the weather and what happened and really kind of just this beautiful sublime winter scene that we see here with these very picturesque qualities. So, you know, so winter still became this, it almost, this almost looks like a kind of reflective painting with the church there in the background. Um, 
Along with other Romantic painters, Friedrich helped position landscape painting as a major genre within Western art. Um, he influenced many painters. Um, uh, one of the most uh, prominent Russian artists of his times, I'm not going to pronounce his name right, um, Ivo Zofsky was also popular outside the Russian Empire. He had numerous solo exhibitions in Europe and the United States. Um, and during his almost 60 year career, he created around 6,000 paintings, making him one of the most prolific artists of his time. Um, the vast majority actually of his works are seascapes, but he also did many uh, winter landscapes. Um, and again, this, this, this whole idea of the sun shining, but imagine on a, on a cold, dark day in Russia, what that must have seemed like. So the work of the 18th century Dusseldorf school is characterized by finely detailed, but still fanciful landscapes. Sorry about the sirens. Um, often portraying uh, religious or allegorical stories. Uh, leading members of the Dusseldorf school um, advocated plein air painting and tended to use a palette of relatively subdued and muted colors. Um, and we see one of these uh, um, beautiful paintings here, this, this very cool sleigh ride, along with the men working with the oxen and all that, but you just really feel winter here. Um, now, it is often assumed, like we've talked about, that plein air painting started with the 19th century Impressionists, but it was in fact very common in the uh, 18th century when um, members of the Hudson River School of the American landscape painters were already painting on plein air. Um, Frederick, uh, Frederick Church was really a, 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 a main painter of the Hudson River School and was known for painting large landscapes uh, that he saw during his travels to the Arctic um, and to Central and South America. Um, so again, we just see these it, the incredible glaciers here and the icebergs that are coming in there. Um, uh, until the, the painters of the Barbizon School in the 19th century France, it was normal practice uh, to execute rough sketches of landscape subjects in the open air, but to produce the finished paintings in the studios. And again, probably not also just because it was also cold, um, but, and, and so the impression is probably would complete an entire painting outside, but it did start much earlier. And here is one of the Impressionists, uh, Renoir. Um, this, his Effects of the Snow, uh, which is, is, was a late 20th century, um, uh, or this was actually part of a late uh, 20th century exhibition featured um, 63 Impressionist winter landscape paintings. Um, so kind of interesting that there has already been this, I didn't know that about this, but that there, there was this whole look of taking a look at winter, um, uh, just as just even through the Impressionists um, as an entire exhibition. Um, and it was actually um, uh, opened in 1998 at the Phillips Collection in uh, Washington, DC, uh, which is really cool. Also appeared um, in San Francisco and in uh, New York City as well. But just again, this uh, I love the plein air ones too. In these outside ones, you just really get a sense of what was going on then as well. And of course, Monsieur Monet. Um, uh, he of course painted outside in many seasons and in every light, as, as we know through all that. Um, uh, this is probably one of his most well known, the Magpie, and we just see the you know incredible uh, um, shadows that are coming through with the bird up there. Um, and uh, we also know that the Japanese, of course, or the, the Impressionists were influenced by the Japanese woodblock prints. Um, and, you know, so this is again, part of that. Um, again, that whole series of severe winters um, probably also helped to increase the number of um, uh, winter landscapes produced by the Impressionists. So weather had something to do with this as well, which I think is really cool um, as we do that. Go to the next one. Uh, and then I wanted to show you this one um, by uh, Wassily Kandinsky. Uh, so it is a winter landscape, but we see as we move into the 19th century, it becomes much, much less traditional. And the colors here have, have really completely changed. Um, and this was uh, in this depiction of the snow blanketed country landscape. Uh, this was one of his last figurative compositions before in turn turning entirely to abstraction. And so you kind of have this yellow sky filled with green and white. Um, and 
then you have this pink path in the center and the and this the hillside is just this you know a riot of colors that we're not used to seeing in the winter but we see by the bare trees that it probably is but again just this whole idea of winter that would uh, has always continued through the ages and uh, we'll switch over to japan uh, again in talking about those japanese wood plant uh, blocks uh, woodblock prints that were uh, helped influence the Impressionists. These were some of the original ones. Um, this is one of the images from the 100 Views of Edo, a, a really quite popular series by Hiroshigi. Um, this depicts a rare stone bridge in the city that we now call Tokyo. Uh, again, kind of captured at this, this, this interesting angle. The bridge kind of seems dwarfed under the snow-filled sky. Um, and the passers passersby are in there with their bamboo hats or, and with the umbrellas uh, kind of get lost in this landscape there because they're cold and trying to get home. Um, and it, it, uh, Hiroshigi's winter scenes are, they said, are really perhaps his most sensitive um, and under the snow that even the big city kind of feels impermanent. It, just this whole idea of, of drifting in the snow. And this is uh, actually a painted scroll by Hokusai in his later years. Um, uh, so we see this kind of old pallid tiger um, kind of floats um, upwards towards something out of sight. Um, this is often interpreted as a mystical self-portrait where the, this, the snow leopard uh, or tiger metaphorically represents Hokusai's spirit as he uh, prepares to um, leave this earthly plane. But you do see those snow covered bushes there. And this is when we were talking about uh, um, the different angles that the Japanese took. So we don't see the rest of the trees, but we know they're there because of just these hints that he's given us. And I love how the trees there look like their claws coming out as well. Uh, so in this picture, um, the prince uh, up there actually on the, the porch um, encourages his playmates to enjoy rough and tumble outdoor winter sports, but he stands aloof on his front porch, not quite one of the boys. Um, even his, uh, his costumes, the clothes he's wearing sets him apart. Um, it's kind of a miniature replica of the military uniform uh, worn by his father, uh, who sits in the parlor that we can see behind there. Um, it is known that Prince Haru um, was unfortunately plagued with illness, but so probably also maybe not able to join in. But again, this wonderful scene of the snowball fight that we, you know, we know now has been going on for centuries. We head over to China now. Uh, uh, Fan Qi was a Chinese artist, uh, worked in an unusually precise um, and realistic style. And he was one of the painters most clearly influenced by Western um, landscape techniques. And they were imported, uh, imported to Nanjing through the prints and books and paintings that were brought by Jesuit missionaries. So love that crossover back and forth. Um, and uh, he was also very much interested in the changing seasons and the times of day and the quality of light. Um, and it, so it kind of gives us that, that whole reminiscent uh, of the Impressionists, but much before that time. And this uh, composition of flowers uh, shows a, se a seasonal progression um, from spring to winter, but we are actually looking from right to left. So we are not, so spring starts over on the right side there. You've got these really beautiful colors, uh, the really bright gold leaf um, uh, uh, background and these beautiful pictorial elements. And then the cranes over there on the, on the snowy uh, bridges as well. And these screens would really uh, belong in the mansions and temple, um, uh, uh, you know, throughout, um, but really just, just beautiful. And again, just seeing the seasons there, this whole idea that, that there, you are part of the seasons and what it represents. And then we jump ahead. Um, this is painter um, Pan, uh, Chinese painter Pan Gong Kai brought the traditional Chinese art of pen and ink drawing to life for his 2011 work featured in the 54th Venice Biennale, which is a big art show in Venice. Um, so he did this corridor um, covered with lotus sketches on, on which this fresh um, layer of animated letters settle like snow. 
Um, the exhibition may have been staged in the middle of the Venetian summer, uh, but the artist actually made sure that visitors didn't miss out on a wintry nip in the air by installing numerous air conditioners to blast cold breezes throughout the installation. So kind of just to me a whole way to, to bring this full circle um, that again, we're still fascinated to this day. And, and this is almost performance art that you can walk through the winter without actually being in winter. And we'll end here with Ansel Adams, um, beautiful um, uh, uh, photograph of the winter Yosemite Valley. Um, you know, just again, that's just that's such a typical picture, but again, this fascination in every medium um, the, that winter has, has been described um, in sculptures and photographs and paintings and things like that. So I want to wish all of you the happiest of holidays and, and hope you've enjoyed our uh, look at winter around the world um, and through the ages. Um, and uh, please take care of yourself and stay safe and stay healthy. Thanks so much.